Good morning and welcome to First Christian Church. We're glad to have you. Feel free to visit among yourselves. Just for a minute, not for the whole church service.
please turn to page 77 in your hymnals? I told you you couldn't do this all morning. <laughs> We have a lot of celebrating to get to today, so we'll try not to have too many announcements. But you know it's a busy week whenever you've got a bulletin full of stuff, or a busy day. <laughs> um, there's youth work going on today at the Crete Moors, so if anybody wants to help with that, they're welcome. That will be right after church. There's a cabinet meeting with ministry meetings to follow tonight, 6 o'clock. Lunch bunch is Tuesday at the Western Sislin on Towson. 
and elders will meet next week, and also the Naturals game, which I think we're going to hear more about in a minute. Uh, one other announcement that I knew about was the nominating committee. If you're a third year deacon or elder or trustee, you're part of the nom nominating committee automatically, and you should have gotten a notice about it, so they'll meet Tuesday evening at 7, I think, in the parlor. That was awesome. That was, that was really nice. Obviously with that, you know what we're talking about, but today's the deadline, so please sign up. This is all free, it's all paid for by us and the youth, so we're going to the Naturals game on June 4th. The game's at 2.05, so we'll leave from the church. We're also gonna take the van, so we'll have seats available, but the sign-up sheet out there today, and Kira instructed me to tell you today's the deadline. We have to turn in the final ticket number tomorrow, so uh, please sign up and join us. It's gonna be a blast. You know, Sean uh, pointed out as he was coming up that we seem to know that song a lot better than the first hymn. <laughs> so that tells you something. All right, uh, a handful of additional announcements. The first is that uh, Vera Brantingham has passed away this Friday in Dallas. Uh, she's going to be interred here in Fort Smith. We don't yet have the plans finalized. Uh, we just received that notice and wanted to pass it along to you. Uh, I'm sure more information as we get it will be in the newsletter. Again, uh, Vera Brantingham has passed away. What's that? Vera Brantingham, a former member here. She's uh, not been with us here at this church for uh, a good handful of years, I understand, but I know um, she's in many of our hearts. Uh, the second thing to note is that we are shifting towards summer programming, which means things get a little lighter, a little looser. I get to have more fun in the sermon series, things like that. Uh, one of the pieces, we have these handouts for our uh, movie nights, our first Friday summer blockbusters. Those are out on the Narthex table. Um, whereas last year we were starting out the Apostles' Creed and we were doing very cosmic movies, looking at God our Father, our Creator. Uh, we are continuing on with the Apostles' Creed, and it shifts, of course, the longest section, the section on Jesus, uh, which makes the movies a lot more uh, concrete, less abstract. No 2001 A Space Odyssey, instead we get to see The Last Temptation of Christ. And so, keep an eye on that. One warning, just to, uh, just to be aware of, we do have a couple of movies that are rated R, but... Um, there are from, from the 80s, if that tells you something. Uh, and so some viewer discretion is advised. Of course, you all know your own families better, but uh, just a heads up on that. There are good movies. Uh, specifically, it's going to be Jesus of Montreal, The Greatest Story Ever Told, and The Last Temptation of Christ. And I think it's a really good way to better understand our faith through uh, visualizing it and discussing it. So do look forward to that. But with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and shift to the church rejoicing in good news. Judy said we have uh, a number of things to, to share today, but I know we also have some birthdays, some anniversaries, things like that. This coming Thursday is Tim Fleming's birthday. All right, happy birthday, Tim. Yeah. Oh, here we go. Yes, ma'am. Amen. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Wonderful. Congratulations. It's good news. It was clarified that is good news. Yes, ma'am. Two 
And the youngest one, Griffin, which most of you know, is getting baptized today. Excellent. A graduation and a baptism. Wonderful. Yes, ma'am. God is good. Oh, um, some, if you didn't hear, uh, there was uh, something was going on. You were on your deathbed at Mercy. I Oh, yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Um, uh, an infected port that quite literally on her deathbed one year ago today, and there she is. Amen. God is good. Any others? All righty then. Uh, let's go ahead and stand and go to God with our call to worship. Our call to worship for this morning reads, As people of faith, we have gathered for worship. We have come to praise God, the Almighty God. Let's pray. God, protector of the widow, the orphan, the stranger. In a world where so many know despair and so many know it actively, you raised your son, Jesus. And though you did not answer every ill, though you did not respond to every concern, at least not yet, you have given us hope for humanity, for renewal to the earth. So God, we ask this day that you continue to strengthen and unify your church. Unify us in our struggles against the forces of death in this world. For violence against creation and humanity obscure the hope of the new life that you offer. God, we, we pray this simple but weighty prayer in the name of the risen Lord as he taught us to pray by saying, our Father, who art in heaven, You may be seated, and if I could invite Julie J. forward. Uh, you should have a handout in your bulletin overviewing our college and high school graduates. This is not an exhaustive list. We know many of us have uh, family members, friends who have graduated, that sort of thing, but we do know there's a handful of people here who have gone through a, a wonderful rite of passage, a, a great time of transition in their life, and so we want to honor that as a church. We call your name if you'd come forward or have a family member come forward the church has a little gift and just want to say we care about you we wish you the best in the future and we're very proud of you sarah bailey blackman sarah here today dustin jay is not here he is in he and ashley Roberts are in Northwest Arkansas at a baseball all-star tournament, so they're not here today. I will say that Dustin um, graduates in July from the University of California in Pennsylvania with a Master of Science in Sports Psychology. 
and Ashley, um, who is his partner, graduates in August from Southern New Hampshire University with a Bachelor of Arts in Forensic Psychology, and she plans to go on to law school. Um, Greta Pryor, Greta is on her way. You wanna come up doing? <laughs> I'll let you tell everybody what her degree is in and where she is on her way to right now. She may have landed. Uh, Greta landed this morning in Spain. She checked into her hotel around 4.30. Uh, that's for her class in international business. She's graduated with a master's in leadership. She'll be done in June and be much relieved. Thank you. Thank you. Actually, Greta received her gift a little early because um, we thought she could use it on her trip. <laughs> um, the next, those are our uh, college graduates. Let's give our college graduates a big hand. And we have three high school graduates, Emily Edison, graduating from Southside High School. Do you want to tell everybody what your plans are? I'm going to go to Arkansas Tech and I'm going to major in elementary education. <laughs> um, Hunter Mendoza, and I guess I will pick up Hunter's since that's my, our grandson. He's graduating from Northside High School. Uh, Grayson Vaughn. Liz texted this morning, I think she has out of town company and Grayson is working today, but he is graduating from Greenwood High School. So let's give our high school graduates a big hand. Judy wasn't joking that we got a lot of good news today. Uh, if we can go ahead and invite forward Margo to speak about the Pentecost offering. He always forgets me. Today is the first of the Pentecostal special offering that we celebrate. Our denomination holds six special offerings during the year. Two of them are really obvious um, for uh, reconciliation, which is pro, um, well, anti-racism, I guess a better way to put it. And the other one is, oh, they said reconciliation, and what is the other one? Pardon? week of compassion and that is to ha just generally help people out and Lord knows we've needed it over these last several years. But the other special offerings go to support the various other ministries of the Disciples Church in general. The one for Pentecost goes to opening up and helping and assisting new church development. Now, when you think about this, where is South? That way, everybody from this point South speaks Spanish. That is going to be an amazing development of churches coming up over the next bunch of years that we also need to think about, and that's what this offering aims at. Um, also, churches that have been um, kind of put to the side because those kind of people start going there. And we've heard several stories of, for example, the church uh, in Louisiana that was put out of their little room they rented in a strip mall because they started offering services to the needy, the homeless, and the LBGT community. These are the kind of churches that God is doing a new thing, and this is what we can help them out. 
They train, assist, equip, and multiply new places of worship. Last week we read in Genesis, God saw everything that God had made, and indeed it was very good. And we can continue this feeling of our work, our church, and God in the world for being very good. Thank you for your offering. Today's scripture lesson comes from 1 Peter, the fourth chapter, verses 12 through 16. This is on page 986 in your pew Bibles if you want to follow along. Suffering as a Christian. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that is taking place among you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you are sharing Christ's suffering so that you may also be glad and shout for joy when his glory is revealed. If you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, a criminal, or even as a mischief maker. Yet if any of you suffers as a Christian, do not consider it a disgrace, but glorify God because you bear this name. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> So I feel I have to apologize to our graduates today. You know, we're, we're delighted to honor you, really and truly. We're so excited for the plans God has for you. But uh, we're also starting up a kind of morbid sermon series. Uh, and so if it's any consolation, you know, today's sermon is called Refining Fires. And to me, that was like all of college, organic chemistry specifically. So it may be helpful. Uh, that's... 
not so much joke, but all right. <laughs> At any rate, uh, let's get into it. This is going to be, just, just heads up, this is going to be a serious sermon series, but it's not going to be pessimistic. It's not. I think looking at it will uh, be better for it. So all that to say, uh, Ernest Becker, in his book, The Denial of Death, is quoted as follows. I think that taking life seriously means something like this that whatever man does on this planet has to be done in the lived truth of the terror of creation, of the rumble of panic of everything underneath. Otherwise, it is false. You know, we, uh, we spend about an hour in worship each week, and in the span of any hour, this one included, about five children worldwide are going to die specifically from the hands of violent abuse. You know, I don't have the exact numbers, but... We can assume thousands, potentially tens of thousands, die every single hour, this one included, from cancer, traffic accidents, and that's only scratching the surface. You know, from the time we enter in through the narthex, the time of our departure, you can, you can imagine that a small town's worth of people are newly in grief and just trying to cope with what life is every single week. All that to say, if you missed the newsletter this week, uh, we are going to spend, be spending three weeks looking at the problem of evil. Uh, the problem of evil, how is it that God can exist while evil exists at the same time? Tragedy strikes us all the time. How, how do those two work together? Doesn't God cancel that sort of thing out? You know, and it's a well-known conundrum. Uh, we can really trace it back to the philosopher David Hume, who himself was contending with the even more ancient philosopher Epicurus, who was about 300 years pre-Christ. Uh, he wrote of this perplexity, David Hume did, and he, he said something that just hits the nail on the head with what the problem is. He said, is God willing to present, prevent evil but not able? Excuse me. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both able and willing? Whence then is evil? I'm sure you can see it's a, it's a difficult problem. It's plagued philosophers and theologians for years, and it's actually been cited as the strongest single objection to the existence of God. And I want to say briefly that historical Christianity is aware of the problem. They've actually they've grappled well with it, and really that's a poor choice of words. It's not as though historic Christianity uh, made a proposition that later was amended because of the problem of evil. Instead, it's that our faith, uh, reading through the Bible, it naturally presents the story of a God who himself contends with evil. We, we don't really have this problem when we dig into Christianity itself, but it's an understandable um, perplexity anyway. Like to, to put that another way, the way our Bibles present the story is God is actively working on the problem of evil. He interceded first in Israel and then ultimately through his son, Jesus Christ, who went as far as to die for our sake and be resurrected. God's very actively working on the problem. This is uh, something that he is continuing to work through. He is just continuing to do it while respecting human free will, by not forcing the solution, the problem of evil, by force of will, but rather through a, a coercive love, a selfless love in Jesus Christ. But all that is to say that us as Christians, we can understand well how God can exist and yet evil exists at the same time. That's really not the perplexity that a lot of people like to make it out to be. You know, even now we have people working in the name of Jesus Christ to clothe the, the naked, to feed the hungry, to care for the poor, that sort of thing, where God and God's people are actively on top of it. But at any rate, th this morning, um, my hope is not to get bogged down in philosophical jargon and reason, because the truth of the matter is that trying to do so uh, with the problem of evil is, is really uh, an exercise in, in hubris. See, the truth about this issue is that it's less of a philosophical issue and more of a lived-out issue, and that changes how we approach it. You, you're likely aware that in our legal system, if a case is presented where the judge has... Uh, has, is holding stake in the outcome, 
they are removed from overseeing that case. We recognize that they will fail to be able to reason well if they're a stakeholder. Maybe they own a piece of the company, know the accused, that sort of thing. And isn't that the case for all of us when it comes to suffering, when it comes to the problem of evil, when it comes to all those really just nasty sort of things out there in the world? Who here is impartial when it comes to suffering, you know? Who here, when we bring up these sorts of issues, really gets comforted by a uh, a theological, philosophical reasoning of an incarnational God who is overcoming the world through coercive love, not through force of will. If that comforted you, you know, you may have bigger problems. Every one of us, church, every one of us, I'm sure, is familiar with evil. We're familiar with suffering in our own ways. You know, we're familiar with what Ernest Becker called the terror of creation, I'm sure. And when we become familiar with it, it's, it's not as though we're approaching a reasonable idea that we work on philosophically. It's something visceral. It's lived out. When we take on suffering, we feel it. And so this morning and throughout this series, uh, we won't be trying to dot every I and cross every T on the philosophical issue that is the problem of evil. Uh, we're also not going to try to list out every possible evil in this world. I'm not going to try to force you to remember any of the hard times you yourself have faced. I don't think that'd be productive. Uh, instead, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be following the Bible's lead, and we're going to be looking to more pastoral and practical wisdom in the face of evil. Uh, we're going to be looking at the answers the Bible gives for real life, not for uh, an abstract philosophical notion. And as we do, uh, we can become aware pretty quickly that the Bible, and especially the letters in the New Testament, contend often with the problem of evil. First Peter is a prime example. You know, the first people who would have read this letter, who would have heard these words that we read in our scripture reading a moment ago, we understand were uh, living under persecution from the Roman Emperor Nero. If you recall from history class, Nero in about 64, we believe, um, set fire to a great portion of Rome, only to then turn around and blame the newly formed Christian movement for it. And from there, he really just set out a vengeful, vengeful persecution against the Christians, against the people that First Peter is writing to. We can even uh, see in Tacitus, a Roman historian's reports, various examples of um, the Christians being hunted like sport, frankly. Some of them were covered in animal skins and had dogs sent after them. Some of them were nailed to crosses, which was already bad enough, but it was nailed to cross in a, in a vengeful mockery sort of way. Some of them were set on fire. Some of them were even burnt alive to illuminate Nero's nighttime garden parties. Which really quickly, you know, I want to pause there and just consider the weight of the suffering that the early church faced. And, and as I do, I kind of got to talk out of both sides of my mouth because, look, it is true that if somebody else had it worse, that doesn't mean you didn't have it bad. You know, like, it's okay to say, I don't like these Brussels sprouts, even while knowing there's kids starving in Africa. Bad is bad, hurt is hurt, there's no sense comparing wounds. But at the same time, the weight of suffering faced by the early church, it does give us a good reality check. First of all, it tells us as Christians in the U.S. A, a timely message that we are not being persecuted. We are not facing things like that. We may not be uh, preferred as often, but we are not being persecuted. Just the same, um, briefly, the persecution of the early church I have a suspicion that God puts that on my heart specifically when I'm being a little melodramatic. You know, there's times whenever I'm in prayer and I'm saying, God, you don't understand how hard I have it and how terrible my life is, you know, all of that. And then I think about um, people being burnt alive for Nero's garden parties, and I realize, okay, God, you know, maybe I'll be all right. At any rate, what I want us to notice in our scripture reading, uh, the sort of practical pastoral tool that this scripture reading offers, it's really twofold. 
First, this morning, I would like us to notice the overall tone of the scripture we just read. It's oddly hopeful. We are reading a letter written from Peter, whom church history understands was crucified upside down, of all things. And he is writing this letter to a, a church that was being hunted like sport by their own government. And it's oddly hopeful. You see that? Why was it a hopeful message? Now, it may have something to do with, with the other important thing to notice in our scripture reading, the image of a fiery ordeal. What that is, uh, is that this image in the letter of Peter, it's, it's a, one he often draws on. It's the image of a refiner's fire, the kind of thing a blacksmith will do to purify a precious metal. He'll you know, heat it up, and it burns off the impurities. And see, what Peter is arguing here, and what you often see in the letters of Peter, uh, is that our faith is refined whenever we face suffering. Whenever we go toe-to-toe -to -toe against evil, we're made stronger for it. Our faith, it comes out deeper, it comes out strong. You just know God in a new way after you've been through something that you didn't know beforehand. Moreover, he tells us that if you suffer in the name of Christ, that is a good thing. That is a union with Christ that is rare. If you have suffered deeply in the name of Jesus Christ, that is so amazing. You have united not just in his death, not just in his resurrection, but in his earthly life, in his ministry, in a deep way. Even more so, you could follow along Peter uh, to the next chapter, and he would point out, hey, look at how short-term suffering is. Look at how eternal Christ is. It's going to be okay. You see all that? This, this weighty image of a refining fire is what Peter is drawing our attention to here. And of course, if we followed the line of thinking beyond even the pages of Scripture, we'd see that this was really the, the first way that the Christian church really grappled with the problem of evil. Uh, Irenaeus, in the earliest second century, he really lined that out as his understanding of where God is in the middle of evil. We can see even today John Hick is a, a popular writer who presented a similar sort of idea. But to get to the nuts and bolts, basically, what this answer is, the problem of evil, is it is asking us to consider that this world was designed to be a place where we grow spiritually world, it was designed to be a place where we grow spiritually. It was not designed to be a place where we're comfortable. So it's right that we face a little bit of temptation from time to time, isn't it? After you face temptation, you learn a lot more about some self-control, one fruit of the Spirit. It's right whenever you suffer sometimes. It causes us to be stronger. Can you imagine if you still had the emotional and spiritual maturity you did when you were this high, now that wouldn't be good. There's good to, to growing up, to facing hard times. Now, of course, you know, that's this answer and none of the answers we're going to be exploring throughout this series are, are perfect philosophical answers that answer every last detail here and there. You know, I think that this is a, a great answer. It's a real lived out answer, but it's not perfect. You know, the easiest critique is that if all evil was was a refining fire, then why is it that, you know, some people who might could use some refinement seem to live lavish, comfortable lives and never face it? Why is it that some people, they seem to have gotten the message pretty clear and yet they still go through it? You see that there, there are still issues with this image, but, but again, this is practical wisdom in the Bible that, that I see so much depth in. It's not perfect, but, but it's something that I want us to, to consider this morning as a, a good way to start this series out. You know, the way Peter writes about really wicked persecution, really wicked stuff, with hopefulness, with an eagerness for what God is doing in the midst of it all, something about that just draws me in. You know, it causes me to wonder about some of the assumptions that we make as people. See, this refiner's fire view, it makes me look back at all the times that I thought I had it bad, and it, it helps me see that God was at work in those times. But the thing is that God may not have been at work in hard times in the way that I had hoped God would be. What I mean by that is so often whenever life just doesn't go the way we think it will, we, we can wonder where God's at work, and, and that's understandable, but what we have to notice within that is that we are 
very often taking all of God and all of God's will and boiling it down to what would make me happy, however I define happiness in that moment. This refining fires view, this view that evil can strengthen us, that suffering can make us better for having gone through it, what that tells us is that maybe God's not in the business of keeping us happy. Maybe God has bigger plans. Maybe he's trying to make us righteous, just, humble, kind, strong, mature disciples. Again, I don't know that that's always necessarily the answer, but I do think that's something that God does more often than we consider. Times of discomfort and real suffering might be the way God grows us at times. Maybe Peter's right when in verse 14 he says, if you are reviled for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory, which is the spirit of God, is resting on you. What he's getting at is that Christ wants us to share in the kingdom of heaven, but he also calls us to share in his cross. Christ calls us to share in the feast of the table. He also calls on us to share in the fast. He is seeking union lifelong with each one of his followers, each one of his people. So all I know really at the end of the day is that this way of looking at things, of suffering as something that can grow us, you know, it's, it's helped me out whenever I've pondered before what God might be doing up there. All in all, this idea of a refining fire, it's, it's helped me find solace in those hard times, but in doing so, it's asked me to recontextualize my faith, to consider that God's not just in the business of making me happy, but God has greater plans than my happiness. More and more each year, you know, church, more and more each year, I've started to consider something. See, it used to be, used to be that, that I thought where Christ was, there was peace and comfort. And I think more and more now that wherever suffering and evil is, there Christ is. May we be willing to walk with him in those times.
Howard Thurman was an American author, philosopher, mystic, educator, and civil rights leader. He was a mentor to many other civil rights leaders, including Martin Luther King, Jr. The following is found in our hymnal, number 508, just a few pages from where we were just singing, and it's attributed to Howard Thurman. It's called, For One Who Suffers. I know I cannot enter all you feel, nor bear with you the burden of your pain. I can but offer what my love does give, the strength of caring, the warmth of one who seeks to understand this I do in quiet ways, that on your lonely path you may not walk alone. As we approach the table today, let us remember that it's open to all, and so everyone is welcome to have communion here today. We will come forward outside, from the outside aisles and return to our seats from the middle aisles. If you are having difficulty and can't make it to the table, someone will serve you in your seat. Thank you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was to be betrayed, took a loaf of bread. As was his custom, he blessed it. He broke it gave thanks for it. And he said, this is my body, which is given for you. Take of it, all of you, eat of it, and do so in remembrance of me. In a similar way, he took the cup after supper. Lifting it up, he gave thanks for it. He blessed it, and he said, this cup, the new covenant, sealed in my blood for the forgiveness of sin of many people. Take of it, all of you, drink of it, and do so in remembrance of me. Let us come forward.
Will you pray with me? You have called us, O God, to be your people. You have loved us and chosen us for your own. Clothe us with compassion, your kindness, your humility, your gentleness, and your patience. Help us forgive one another as you have forgiven us and bind us all together in the perfect unity of your love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Believe it or not, we have one more special edition this morning. Uh, we will have the invitation to discipleship, the benediction, and then notice that we will have a graduate blessing. We will be closing out with a song in our chalice, hymn, our chalice praise hymnal. So without further ado, receive now this benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Thank you.